Welcome guys to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, Steve Hall. And today we have another amazing guest who is Martin McDonald, who I'm sure a lot of you have actually heard of. We kind of sit within the same sort of networks. Um, and I mean, Martin has blown up over the years, uh, the past few years. I mean, I can't even remember when I first heard of Martin. It might have even been back in like 2010, 2011. Um, when I went to kind of the first Alan Aragon conference. I think, Martin, were, were you there? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think that's when I first kind of heard and saw Martin. I was kind of like, I, I, I was no one back then. I'm still no one right now. Um, so it's just yeah. amazing to see, to see Martin develop and grow. And uh, to just give an introduction to him, for those of you who don't know, um, if we were to give Martin a title, I get, well, it should be nutritionologist, but... Um, <laughs> It's a clinical performance nutritionist. So Martin first kind of developed his name working with celebrities, um, with some pretty high, like, high class celebrities in terms of kind of very well known and got tremendous results with them. Um, but also working with athletes mm. and is the founder of MacNutrition.com, uh, which has had kind of internships um, and consultancies going on for years, which have been really, really good. Um, and has recently launched Mac Nutrition University over in the UK, but it's an online course um, that's 12 months. Like, I mean, the reviews, everything I hear about it, when people post into groups asking what courses they should do, it comes up all the time. And I've never seen a bad word have spoken about it. So I can only say it's something fantastic. And we might as well bring up now that, in fact, it is going to be launching again soon. I know you were only going to do, I think it was two launches within 2017, but you've had so much interest. You're actually launching again this weekend and people can kind of um, get on that as soon as possible because I know it sells out quick, doesn't it, Martin? Mm. Yeah, so uh, basically we're opening enrollments on the 3rd of July. So whenever this goes out, it's on the Monday and um, that's for our September the 18th is the course start date yeah so our september um intake so yeah but yeah i mean it's the popularity of it is huge i mean it goes without saying so i will make sure there's links in the description box below for people to click on so they can get onto that straight away when they listen to this podcast stop it now and go and get on it because it will sell out fast um what i also wanted to say is i think part of your name was really built through joe wicks and kind of blasting him a little bit but i think in a very, very professional and well done manner. Um, I think with social media and things, there has to be of infotainment about it. Um, but you, it was never done in a kind of derogatory way. It was never done attacking Joe Wicks as a person. Um, it was always done on his information, which I think is, is a really positive thing for any personal trainers listening or anyone who does want to kind of maybe pick holes in arguments that they see out there that aren't scientifically based. Kind of use Martin as an example. And also, we have a lot of natural bodybuilders who listen to this show. And Martin did compete um, back in the day, uh, not for many years, and had some uh, impressive calves. And like I've seen <laughs> post uh, photos of you back then, and you were you're in really good shape. And you, I mean, you're still in great shape now. Uh, but obviously, a family man and have a very kind of um, a business that takes a lot of your time. So I think it's just interesting to know that. Uh, you did natural bodybuilding and I took this quote from your kind of about page on your website and mm. in that you said kind of learning the practicalities of nutrition and what the human body is capable of has been invaluable to your career and I've got to say it hands down <laughs> to get to like those lean body fat levels for a show you learn so much about the human body and your own body but also the, a lot of the kind of main principles apply across the board and they can help other people get lean as well um so yeah i just thought that was a, an interesting and hopefully a good introduction to martin and anything else you want to add martin please go for it now um no i think that's the most extensive and best intro <laughs> I, I i do often give people like nice compliments about their intros sometimes i don't because they're rubbish but um, <laughs> Uh, I think that's definitely the most extensive one. So um, thanks for doing your research. And it's quite cool to have that. I, I completely forgotten about that quote that you've just said there. And I do, um, I do attribute some of my, I suppose, practical knowledge and being able to work with people and knowing what, um, you know, it's knowing what you can put people through and what they can handle and also knowing what you know, we're all different, but what broke you, what really taxed your willpower and those kind of things. 
Um, so it, I definitely think it helped me. I mean, I have been very vocal and honest that I was a bit of an idiot in terms of, um, you know, through no fault of my own um, necessarily, but basically just following the the kind of, I was on the forums. I know forums are kind of dead these days, but um, yeah, on the bodybuilding forums, the the older bodybuilders taking advice from them, doing the doing the stuff that I suppose we now know is is silly, really, and unnecessary. And um, it's I always say to my students, like you, when I'm teaching you some of this stuff, if you've followed the good people, if you've um, you know that you're the kind of era that you were born into this industry or whatever, you're you know you've listened to the right podcasts you're lucky and and the fact that i'm t- telling you whatever about meal frequency or the fact that you can eat some you know bread and it's not going to completely ruin your physique or somehow magically stop you losing fat um it may sound basic but you know from the era that i came from that was all you know that was flipping futuristic yeah. stuff that was and um the the problem is is it still does massively exist if we're in this echo chamber of evidence based practice we think Everyone knows that. Um, and then I've just done this post on Facebook today about this fat loss coffee. And it's like, people are like, oh my goodness, this is all over my timeline. Or, you know, ketogenic diets being some kind of new crazy thing that, oh, I've just discovered ketogenic. And it's like, these have been around for like 50, you know, I even, someone was quoting something I was speaking to re- recently from the early um, you know, it was like 1911 about some of this stuff. So this goes back forever. It's not something new, but um, yeah, we're we're in this stage now of a time of plenty of actually science and evidence-based practice, and it. Um, but there's still a lot to be done. But with regards to the about me, pretty much you covered everything. Um, it's yeah, my kind of background was within just, and it, it's funny when I went to Alan's conference, whenever it was. Um, I was, I suppose I was practicing, I was, I was always doing a job rather than being what I am now, a bit of a kind of online troll or whatever mm-hmm. you want to, uh, whatever I get called. So um, it's, you know, I was there, I was working with, you know, international athletes, medal winners, um, you know, some of these kind of celebrities, um, if you want to call them that. And um I kind of, yeah, I was building my consultancy, but very much offline. And, and when, you know, within MNU, one of the things that I suppose I feel like I've tried to do a lot is to empower people to make a legitimate business because I made all the mistakes in the book. You know, I, I studied for many years. I've, I've got a degree, two postgraduates, but no one ever told me about, I mean, I wasn't even taught about adherence. I know that sounds crazy. But, um, you know, I studied clinical nutrition at a brick and mortar academic institution and we weren't taught about adherence to anything. Um, I I genuinely don't think I can remember it being mentioned. So, you know, coming from that point of view, I had all these clients who who weren't getting the results that I would expect. And, you know, there was me trying to work out what metabolic damage they had or, you know, um, and and from there it was a case of, okay, trying to build clients and you know having to work out how to do a consultation with someone you didn't have people doing like podcasts there was no podcast when i when i started doing this um there was no um there was just nothing online basically you know you had lyle um, mcdonald who i'm sure all of your listeners um you know if they don't know who he is then just give up basically (laughs) Um, but he was like pretty much the first man to write an article on nutrition on the internet and um and he's done well for having done that for his kind of search engine up some optimization. But like stuff like that, we're now teaching our students about how to have a legitimate business, how yeah. to have a service brochure, how to, you know, set up corporate corporate wellness contracts with people. So we don't just cover the nutrition. We, you know, we absolutely cram in in 52 weeks. I, I, again, I posted on Facebook today saying, um, yes, it, it's not a short course because someone was looking for short courses. And I said, it's not a short course, but it's 52 weeks and it's a lot shorter than a three year degree. And I I, genuinely, we we cover more nutrition and more um, applicable information within there and within the the mentoring lab, which is kind of the support forum that we've created than than I covered in the entire five years of, of my study. So 
anyway, yeah, that, that you, you kind of covered everything I've done. And uh, like you said, the whole Joe Wicks thing was uh, it, the f- people actually said to me, oh, did you do the Joe Wicks thing on purpose? Because that was back in 2015. Mm-hmm. And, and MNU um, was literally conceived like I've always wanted to have my own course for you know, probably a decade, but I didn't have the time. I didn't have the infrastructure. Um, because again, to do what we've done, like I have, like you said, we've, we've offered internships, I've offered unpaid internships that then turned into jobs for people. We've pretty much offered every person who's done an internship, a job. And, um, you know, it, we now have a, we're like a a mini academic institution in and of ourselves um so we do offer a lot of student support on that front but i've always wanted always wanted to offer it and um people it it kind of the conception of it was literally we we run our mentorship weekends which is like 10 people really intensive and um it's just i love speaking face to face with people Mm -hmm. and um teaching and then they were like we want you to do something longer we want a course and i basically um was like okay sent this survey out what do people want and people were like we want it to be recognized we want it to be a year long we want this we want that and i was like oh and i basically just panicked and was like <laughs> oh, there's no way yeah. um and i said this on another past podcast actually i basically had stopped working with clients at that point and mm-hmm. was just managing my staff and, and doing kind of team meetings on clients and um i this basically this um the story goes this guy pretty much said to me i want you to work with me uh, i don't work with people i'm sorry and he said there's a blank check um <laughs> if you help me, it's a blank check whatever you want to charge and i was like what does that even mean <laughs> um, there's no such thing as a blank check and uh, it was just like look come and meet me let's see if you want to help me and i was like i really don't have the time it wouldn't make me happy to work with you i th- you know, I don't want to do it. I'll just offer you a bad service. Yeah. And then pretty much it was, how much does your happiness cost? <laughs> but that was basically the mentality. And I was like, what do you even mean? <laughs> um, and uh, I basically met him. And again, someone with lots of money. I didn't want someone to own me. I didn't, Yeah. Um, I don't like that mentality, but I met him and he was like the loveliest person. And I was like, oh, right. And then it was like, pick a figure. Yeah. And basically that paid for us to shut our consultancy for Amazing. six months. And um, we wrote MNU. So MNU, when I did the Joe Wick stuff, didn't exist. Um, it, it wasn't. It wasn't like because people have said to me, "Oh, I saw you get loads more um, active on social media <laughs> around that time." And I was like, "I, it wasn't a thing. I just um, did that post. It kind of went not viral because that's seen the millions, but like mini viral within our kind of little yeah. industry." And um, people started knowing about me. I got so much hate. You wouldn't believe and that would have really depressed me at one time because as much as people think I'm a mean person I'm actually a people pleaser so Mm -hmm. um but I got so much love for it and like you know even now you saying that I did it in a professional way like it doesn't mean a lot because I Mm -hmm. felt I was very I never threw insults basically the comments on the thing were like oh his hair his accent and I was like I couldn't care like I couldn't care less about those things like I can hardly talk about hair (laughs) so it's um it it was literally just that I it was very much I felt it lacked integrity and yeah. I said that and I said it in a you know in an okay way and then it kind of kicked off and then because people wanted more I was like oh this is fun mm-hmm. um so I just did it more and then anyway kind of a year later MNU was launched and then you know well not launched I basically told the internet oh by the way I'm probably going to do this course and then it just went massive and I was like oh crap like I, I've never actually said this so this is a um steve hall exclusive nice. but um, <laughs> mnu was pretty much going to be a a youtube course on on a um you know just like on a private website where you yeah. just pay to log on and do it and um you know and i'd spoken to kind of friends in the industry like chris burgess so i'm sure you're aware of and mm-hmm. it was like you know giving me advice because he's obviously got a really successful kind of members site and he was like this is what you could do these are some cool plugins like you know he was really generous yeah. with his time and so I was like, yeah, yeah, we'll do this, that, and the other. And then everyone was like, we want this, we want this, we want this. And then I was like, oh my goodness, you know, people are expecting something massive. And I, I suppose I've said to people, um, I didn't, 
you know, I'm not a good marketer. I'm not necessarily even a very good businessman, but, and I don't even have a very big following. You know, you say like, oh, I was a nobody. I'm a nobody now. Like I'm still a nobody really. And, um, but it was just the fact that the very small following I had was a very high quality and a very loyal following. And they just wanted someone to basically sit down and produce it and then they would study it. So we, we basically went, oh crap. So, so then we, I said we shut this consultancy for six months and that was 18 months ago and we've not opened it since. Wow. Um, so yeah, it's a case of, um, and we did, we basically got, you know, over time, you know, clients kind of went through. And so we now only have our kind of top tier um, kind of corporate clients left. Mm-hmm. You know, we, so I always go on this podcast and I end up getting these messages. Oh, do you do online, you know, nutrition coaching? And I'm like, no, I definitely don't my stuff. And so basically I'll say now to anyone, we, we don't offer any kind of nutrition support. So please don't. Um, but we do, you know, if people sign up for our newsletter list, we, we give away loads of free lectures, loads of free information. And it's not, you know, we're not going to voodoo mind trick you into paying us money for the course. Just go and take the free information it's decent stuff i think mm-hmm. um so anyway that's a ridiculously long intro <laughs> <laughs> well to follow my long intro you had to come out with something long <laughs> yeah. as well so but i think i think that gives people a really good insight into your character into kind of w- what you're about and where you've come from and, and i'm really glad actually that you didn't do the youtube course in fact um because i know personally i've done the precision nutrition course and a lot of that is just, I mean, it's online um, and kind of it's nice to have more of the, the course materials and things that I've seen um, through MNU. And it, it, it's something that's definitely attracted me. It's literally a time thing for myself, in fact, yeah. because, I mean, hearing you talk about it just makes it sound ever more attractive. And the, the talk about and the thing I think is really important is the fact you teach kind of personal trainers or people how they could make this into a career. And then those people are helping more people and we are spreading kind of the evidence-based practice Mm. further. So it's kind of like serving a bigger purpose than yourself. So you're actually doing much more than coaching kind of one or like a few individuals by coaching people to become better coaches. It's helping with so many more people. So I think yeah, you're kind of serving a bigger purpose. Not you probably don't don't make your head too big, but um, I think you're (laughs) probably a very humble person anyway. So um, right. I think we've had a good kind of insight into all of that. There is, we have some main content I wanted to get through. And this first question, I think I saw it a while ago on social media and there was a bit of a back and forth, I think between you and Joseph Agu potentially, um, who's also been on the podcast talking about protein intakes and things, which was really good. And I think I then heard it on another podcast, it might've been Under the Bar, um, where it was something along the lines of, and I couldn't find the actual quote, so <clears throat> sorry if I end up kind of misquoting you, but it, it was along the lines of kind of diet as aggressively as you can, um, kind of around almost like basal metabolic rate level of intake, and you won't lose muscle. Um, if something, it, it sounded quite like, well, not absurd, but quite like out there as a claim, and I'd love to hear whether you still stand by that claim, whether I kind of misreferenced you um, and what your thoughts are surrounding that. Because I think that, that sounds incredibly attractive to a lot of people, especially when they've heard of like mini cuts or maybe like La McDonald's aggressive fat loss diets. Um, so yeah, let, let's go with that question. Yeah. So I, I, I also can't necessarily remember the exact quote, but it was something like <clears throat> diet on as few calories as you can realistically maintain um to to achieve your goal it was something like that it was, oh, it was yeah. slightly better, it was slightly better worded <clears throat> i actually never put a figure on it and probably the figure you've put about kind of at bmr is maybe even higher than i am saying so it's even more attractive it's even more bro yeah. um <clears throat> So like I'm talking as low as you can go, give or take, within the context of um, adequate protein and adequate training intensity. So um, I was actually quite surprised when, um, when there was kind of people questioning it because like you've mentioned there about Lyle, um, he, he obviously has, um, and, I, and I always say this, like I've never read it, the Fat Loss Rapid mm-hmm. ha- Fat Loss Handbook, and um uh so i've not read it but i i should 
and um, you know, for Lyle, I would I would um, make sure I bought it because okay. people flip in plagiarize him all the time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the fact that I obviously have seen stuff on forums over the last decade about it. It's it's nothing new. So I'm not necessarily trying to be this like new age guru or anything like that. It's the 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 reason I ended up saying it was because there is this I um, since I've been a kind of a bit of a uh, figurehead sounds very arrogant, but I'm going to say it <laughs> figurehead for kind of evidence based practice. I've started to be asked to do talks for evidence-based practitioners now when you walk into a room full of evidence-based practitioners it's very hard and like my worst nightmare is someone come to one of my talks and walk away either bored or having learned nothing now mm-hmm. if you've got the right mindset you can learn from learn you know from anything even if you go to a talk and you know any everything at least the way that someone phrases it at least the way you know i get lovely compliments from you know leading kind of you know world leading academics saying do you know what? i listened to you on that podcast and i would love to be able to teach complex subjects as as simply as you yeah. make them sound and i'm like oh my goodness like it, it's not something i've trained to do it's just so it's like a hugely you know nice compliment mm-hmm. to get um so with regards to this uh, this thing of kind of rapid fat loss and 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 not trying to sound new age as it were, the reason I talked about it was I go into these rooms of evidence based practitioners and I, I can't go. Do you know what bread doesn't make you fat? Like everyone's going to be like, right, yeah. like tell something we didn't know. Like um, you know, gluten isn't going to kill us all and. Um, you know, you don't have to eat seven meals a day to boost your metabolism. Everyone's like, yeah, we all know that. Teach us something new. So I do spend, I think this is another thing. When I do prepare a presentation, I don't just hash out the same stuff. I think about the audience just like I would with a client and go, how am I going to give the best um, thing possible? And, you know, I do get lovely reviews on kind of my, you know, I, I like speaking in public. I, I try to, I don't try to make it funny. I, I am blessed with the ability to make people <laughs> laugh. I went to see Ricky Gervais last night, and he's also um, blessed with that ability. <laughs> so, um, you know, I love speaking in public, but it's I want them to go away going, wow, that was really good. And when I do corporate stuff, people walk in thinking that, you know, all of the easiest thing, I can literally go in and go, do you know what? Eating breakfast doesn't boost your metabolism. They're like, no, freaking <laughs> way. No, that just blows their mind. So, you know, walking in there, I was like, what are people doing wrong, and how can I help them get better results with their clients? And so I basically went in and said, diet them aggressively. And everyone's like, what? And I'm like, yeah, you can put them on 1,000 calories if you want. And everyone's like, no, not 1,000 calories. It's like this thing. As soon as you hit 1,000 calories, it's like you're trying to kill people. <laughs> or bro. You're, you're damaging people's metabolisms. Um, so anyway, I, I came up with this phrase of dieting people aggressively. Now, one, one area where I suppose some and and again trying to talk to your listeners and you and you know people who might be listening to this is when i talk about you know even the whole concept of muscle loss muscle loss is hugely 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 overplayed because people see decent bodybuilders talking about muscle loss and think it applies to them mm-hmm. and you know it's like oh you know you will have had it as well i've had clients over the years <clears throat> oh I dieted before coming to see you and I just lost so much muscle. So I must have been doing something wrong. So can you help me? And like, yeah, brilliant. Let's hope they were doing something wrong so that I, you know, can warrant charging them for my time. But very often it's just you were fat and now you lost weight and now you're not as big as you were. And it Mm -hmm. sucks. Like, um, yeah, you know, natural bodybuilding more than anything sucks because you look rubbish when you in clothes, when you diet. So, um, it is one of those areas where people think muscle loss occurs, but it's it's nothing. It's they might be glycogen depleted. They um, they might have just had a lot more fat than they thought they would. Because yeah. again, you look at a decent bodybuilder. Who did I see recently? Um, I think they might have been an assisted bodybuilder. But they basically put up a picture saying this is me 12 weeks out and you know like i don't know what people are doing now like i know you know there's like six month diets now which is you know in a way i think 
kind of cool and if you want to get to the kind of contest condition people are nailing now it's like 20 plus week diets but you know the old school was 12 weeks Mm -hmm. and he posted this picture of i'm 12 weeks out and he was shredded shredded glutes (laughs) he was complete and he was like i've got about 10 pounds to go (laughs) and it's like what it's like 10 pounds um so when people are getting an actually good condition um muscle loss becomes an issue that's a fact and i wrote in alan arrogan's research review about this that my biggest issue with the evidence-based industry is a they're treating a bodybuilder like they're you know five stone wanting to lose five stone to just look just be happy with their body not step on stage Um, so maybe to get on stage, they've got seven stone to lose and all they want to do is lose, you know, three to five stone to feel good. And they're going, right, we're going to aim for half to one pound a week because I'm not going to diet you too aggressively. Mm -hmm. Um, but the problem is, is then you get people who are starting a six month diet and they are 20 to 30 pounds, um, over stage weight going, right, I don't want to lose any muscle. I'm going to lose half a pound a week. So I basically drew these curves and essentially based it on um, some of the research on the maximum available energy from adipose tissue. I'm, I'm, you're nodding, so I'm sure you must have kind of seen some of this stuff. And, you know, Lyle wrote about this ages ago. Um, Greg Knuckles has written about this. I've basically put some content within um, some lectures that I've done. And we're all around about the same um, figure so the figure for your listeners that they can use and the problem with this figure is is that you have to know your body fat percentage accurately and none of us know it accurately you know it's it's hugely variable based on the method that you use but yeah. you know we're gonna have to go with dexa as being the one and you know at the end of the day if you're that anal about your bodybuilding and your training and your nutrition like basically if you're listening to this podcast yeah. you can afford the 100 to 200 pounds depending on where you are in the world and country to for one off dexa to get your starting point um so let's say it brings you out at whatever let's say you're lucky because again dexas when i've worked in kind of professional football they you know came from other clubs doing skin fold calipers it's like yeah i'm nine percent <laughs> And then we put them on the DEXA and it was like, you're 15% or you're 14%, you know, because we, we generally find it's like this plus 5% for DEXA based on other stuff. So, um, you know, you come out as 15%, which on, you know, other methods, you're like, oh, I'm 10%. And um, I use this figure of divide your percentage body fat by 15. So if you, I'm making the maths easy for myself, obviously, 15% body fat. Or or let's say you're a female um, bodybuilder um, and you're 30% body fat because that's not out of the realms of of body fat of maybe the peak of an off-season for a female bodybuilder. So let's use her as an example. 30% body fat. um, Divide that 30 by 15 and you get two. So she can lose 2% of her body weight per week. And we know that the um, release, the lipolysis of... um, fat tissue um or the release of energy from fat tissue i.e lipolysis we can supply all of the energy needs to lose at that rate of weight loss Mm -hmm. so that figure is you know 15 is like my figure i think lyle uses 13 greg said 20 so if you're like a conservative type and you think oh i always lose so much muscle use greg's if you're if you um want to rush things <laughs> use lyle's if you want to sit kind of in, in the middle ground or I, i'm definitely more towards the kind of lyle realm just because of um there's you know there's like one study really and then one follow-up that we're all basing this data on but i just kind of went through all of the data from you know all of the kind of studies that i thought these are half decent studies which you know maybe used a little bit of resistance training a little bit of um exercise as well and you know and use decent measures of body composition and you know i don't i think the 20 is too conservative personally based on what i've seen so the other thing is is all of these studies people go okay martin you base on studies look at this study they lost muscle and it's like right what did they do no resistance Mm -hmm. training you know and you look at you look at the research and you've got regular females 
dieting without resistance training on 1.2 grams per kilogram protein and they don't lose muscle. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like, and you think on 2.4 grams per kilogram with resistance training, with like some caffeine supplementation to enhance lipolysis, blah, 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 you think you're gonna lose muscle. Um, you know, on a whatever deficit we're talking. So um, that 2% weight loss that I said there, or let's say it's 1% for the 15% male, the calorie deficit, you just need to work out what the supposed yeah. calorie deficit would be to, to reach that. So let's say that is a 800, 900, 1000 calorie deficit. So I think when people saw me saying this, they were maybe like, oh, that you're saying you could diet on zero calories or 500 calories. And I'm, I'm like, no, because actually no one can diet on that and sustain it because yeah. I've said the number of calories that you can realistically maintain that will take you all the way to your goal. So um, what that means is if you can do 600 calories for a day, but then you end up eating 2000 calories on the next day, your average yeah. calories are not, you know, or your, your calories are not 600. Your calories, you know, are whatever I said there, 2000 plus 600 divided by two. So 1300 calories, let's say your TDEE -E is 2000 because you're a small individual you know your deficit is only 700 yeah. so i think the thing i was trying to get people away from is this idea of well aggressive dieting leads to weight regain and it's like no it doesn't aggressive dieting leads to weight regain when people are idiots yeah. and they aren't coached to live which is this new thing which i've been hammering for probably the last six months is the the idea that we we, even we as evidence-based practitioners, sometimes forget to coach people to live. We coach people to have habits that help them lose weight. But then I don't want to lose weight anymore. I've got no habits in place. You know, it's like, oh, I eat more vegetables. But it's like, but what do I do to maintain weight? I don't want to be in a deficit. How do I do this? Okay, I'm going to add back more food. You haven't taught me what maintenance looks like. So, um, you know, the key thing that I was getting at was if you look at the actual research, aggressive dieting in overweight populations um, leads to faster weight loss, obviously, um, more weight loss and greater percentage of weight loss maintained in the long term. So whatever that may be, one to three years. Um, and we, you know, that's in crappy studies where they don't have great evidence-based practitioners coaching people to live giving them accountability um so yeah that was that was my point and so the the just to kind of say one more thing is in my alan arrogant um article i i basically drew these curves which i mentioned earlier and i said this is what did i do i think i did I had three curves and I can only remember two of them. Mm -hmm. Basically, the top one was the whole, you need to lose half a pound a week or a pound a week or whatever it was. And I did the curve. And then I did a hypothetical model of like that 15% yeah. person losing 1% body weight. And I and it's a decaying curve yeah. because as you lose more body fat, you need to lose at a slower rate. So the curve, if you did it on a like this strict rule, and if I ever prepped anyone, I'd, I'd use this this fancy spreadsheet I did and um, it's this decaying curve and I think at the end of the curve you could only have a 230 I think it was calorie deficit if you wanted to ensure that no lean body mass was being lost cool. um, at that stage so yeah that, that's not an aggressive diet but when you're whatever you know seven eight percent true seven eight percent i.e three percent on all the other measures body fat you can only be in a tiny little deficit mm -hmm. um, and that is where true muscle loss occurs when people are lean really lean but the idea that i'm going to do a mini cut and i'm going to lose a, a pound or two a week it's like don't bother just aim for you know just do as you know as low calories as you can realistically maintain for the duration of your diet you know and that's where the the phrase kind of came from um and I think the the key thing here is that you can't be an idiot. You have to have protein at the level that you and your listeners, like after Joe's podcast, I'm sure he mentioned these figures. Um, 
you have to have your protein adequate and okay. and maybe in a deficit they need to be slightly higher so we've got our, our ranges i've created a new kind of uh range on on or a way to basically decide on protein ranges for individuals based on um even how how long they're awake in the daytime and where that might sit and then for a deficit and a surplus but but the ranges that the industry tend to use like 1.8 to 2.7 and the higher end of that range for a deficit you're you're winning the key thing is people still do stupid things like counting protein from kind of the bcaa's that you're sipping all day long and um the 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 issue with a hypocaloric state is that it potentially and i think uh, i'm saying potentially because i'm not 100 percent sure that all of the literature supports this but i certainly know decent literature su supports this that the muscle protein synthetic response in a deficit is harder to stimulate you get kind right. of like metabolic resistance a bit like in in the elderly mm -hmm. so rather than shooting for your like 0.3 grams per kilogram of body weight to hit leucine threshold from a dairy source of protein you might want to go up towards like 0.4 or 0.5 on a meal by meal basis so if you've got loads of little meals that are 0.2 you you're not necessarily going to be doing what you need to do so that's why i said like the bca protein probably does count but you should be having these bolus meals yeah. of protein to, to stimulate this response. And um, the final thing I actually want to say as well is, because I know some people will go away and use what I've said, and maybe without thinking critically, is you do also need to bear in mind, because, oh, sorry, I'm going off on loads of tangents here, <laughs> so I do apologize. But there's, there's two studies as well where... Um, I've, I've talked about these previously and people go, oh, well, if you diet slower, you can gain muscle on a diet. Right. I think there's one study that's Garth, definitely, and the other yeah. one might be Miro or Mettler. Um, but they, the problem is in those studies and, and the other studies in obese populations, like dieting people on like 800 to 900 calories a day versus slower. And you see the curves. In fact, Danny Lennon had wrote a bit on this as well and actually – mentioned me uh, in the article because he knows i've spoken about this but i think he's drawn the curves but it's like you diet fast and then what do you do in the studies they take that data point and they go oh there's like a study um i think it might be the garth paper but they basically go oh look their testosterone um you know is in a worse position and the another study which it's like trembly or someone like that is like, oh, they've got more um, adaptive thermogenesis or more metabolic adaptation. It's like, of course they freaking have. Mm -hmm. They've lost double the amount of weight that they have. They're going to be dieting for all of that time. What are these guys going to be doing? Going back to maintenance and life is better at maintenance. Yeah. And and this is why I teach people, teach people to coach. If you can get someone to their goal weight quicker, they've paid you for a 20-week service, get them there in 10 weeks. Don't draw it out for 20 but also manage expectations mm -hmm. with your clients. Do whole de decent counseling and go, you know, we're going to get there in half the time. Don't move the goalposts. Like, yeah, maybe we can work on being a bit leaner, but let's go 10 weeks down. You're at your goal weight. Let's do 10 weeks of coaching to live, re regaining some. Um, so again, like the lean tissue, if you lose any lean tissue, you can regain it like that, mm -hmm. going back to maintenance. So it's like that other study, which I can't remember the name of that, um, you know, they lost twice the, the weight and, you know, the other group gained a little bit of muscle and it's like, yeah, but in half the time, let me go back to maintenance. My training will be loads better than yeah. yours for the rest of the study duration. I will gain as much, if not more, who knows? Um, so, yeah, in, in all of these different areas, it's just a case of, you know, the, the idea of longer dieting for natural bodybuilders, I think is amazing because diet breaks, strategic refeeds which again i talked about in that article um for alan is you know you diet for longer you can be a bit more aggressive have a refeed period have a diet break have a maintenance period have a mini bulk you mentioned mini cut like do a mini bulk inside yeah. your mini cut um you know a mini bulk might be a 200 calorie surplus or let's say a 350 calorie surplus you can do that for 10 days and you might not gain a single ounce of fat because 
you're just restoring glycogen levels. But let's say you do one day of like 10 to 12 grams per kilogram carbohydrate, like happy days, carb coma. And um, so you're, you're maximized on that. 350 calories surplus for 10 days, or 175, I'm gonna say, gives you 20 days of surplus. You'll probably, but probably not, but at the absolute maximum, you'll gain one pound of fat in 20 days with based on the whole 3,500 mm-hmm. calories. But you've had 20 days of surplus. So training was better, life was better, hunger was non-existent or you know, less so, all of these great things. So pretty much, I reckon I have a, that's the best <laughs> review of that statement that I've ever done. And so now if anyone tries to go, ah, blah, blah, I'll just send them to your <laughs> and go go listen to the first like 40 minutes of that no i think you explained that incredibly well and throughout it i was like think like it was switched like sparks were going off in my mind into ways i've kind of said a similar thing but maybe said it slightly differently like i've talked about in the past i wrote an article about like this calorie deficit sweet spot people might have seen it on my website and talking about how like a one pound loss per week is not individualized whatsoever to people yeah and i tend to use a similar but i think it's more along the lines of kind of eric helms has his like one percent if you're like 15 percent body fat if you're over this 1.5 percent so if you're like 20 percent body fat as a male 1.5 percent and then 0.5 percent as you're like 10 percent or below and so it Um, scales like that so it's a similar sort it probably lands at virtually the same area and especially because it's a range like you had 12 and then up to um, 20 and then 30 so it probably lines up really well and I think that's really important to remember and I think maybe people would think of your idea and not think about the fact that when you are really lean to sustain like a 1.5% loss of body weight you'd have to be on stupid low calories you wouldn't be able to sustain that so that's kind of like your clause um, at the end which kind of yeah reinforces your point and so on surface when people don't think it through it sounds very kind of like whoa that does not sound cool but in practicality it works itself out so um, no, I think that was really well explained and I loved the idea because you talked about kind of the mini bulks and the maintenance periods and the diet deloads and things. And anyone who's been listening to, we do something, me and Pascal, who's the other coach um, at Revive, uh, we've been doing Revive to Stage, which is like our steps to our contest. And okay. I've been taking kind of deloads and diet breaks. And I had recently, I had a mini bulk, which I called like a marination phase and then went through maintenance. Gosh. And then kind of, yeah, went through these phases and it's making fat loss so easy. So during the times that I'm losing fat, I'm going for that sweet spot, that maximum rate of fat loss without muscle loss, kind of basically the most I can sustain and then going through periods of breaking it up. And the body, yeah, I found the body responds and we're getting more and more data. The body responds really well to having breaks. Um, And like, I guess if you go too slow, you can, the body kind of just, it doesn't respond very well to subtle changes especially when you think about foods could be inaccurate by 20 percent. maybe if you're eating a lot of like packaged foods you could easily eat up your calorie deficit and you don't even realize you're not dieting Um, so no i think you demolish that and i think we actually made a good segue to the second point i wanted to go on to thank you guys for listening to part one of the revive stronger podcast with martin mcdonald There will be part two in which we're going to talk about maintenance phases for bodybuilders and for general population and why they're so important and how to go about them. And also supplementation for sports and general health and how you can set up your diet so maybe you don't really need to supplement supplement with much. Uh, I also want to mention that the links we described and talked about within this podcast are all going to be below. So if you want to get into Mac Nutrition University, definitely check out the description box so you can get onto that as soon as possible because that is happening in the next coming week. So cheers guys, revive stronger and look out for part two.